speaker today will be Ryan O'Donnell from CMU, Carnegie Mellon University. He will give a series of three lectures on the hardness of approximation this morning, tomorrow afternoon, and Wednesday afternoon. And now we have the first lecture. Okay, I have a mic on. Is it okay? Everybody can hear? Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, how to prove hardness of approximation results. And um, I guess the first course will, the first lecture will be mainly definitions, I'm sorry to say, mostly. And the second one, I'll do some elementary uh, sketch of how you uh, prove such hardness results. And the third course, we'll get into some more interesting mathematics. So uh, the theory of you know, P and NP and NP completeness is very satisfactory for um, decision problems, sort of yes-no problems. But uh, another natural class of problems is optimization problems, where you're trying to maximize or minimize something. And here, the theory of what's hard and what's uh, easy for efficient algorithms is not so um, well understood. So that's what we'll be talking about. Let me give you some examples of such uh, optimization problems. So the first one is called uh, max cut. Can you see this? Okay. Um, this is a very basic algorithms problem. So you're given a graph. And you want to two color the vertices. To maximize the number of cut edges. This is bichromatic. So in the normal sort of uh, basic decision version, you're given a graph G and maybe a number K and you're asked yes or no is the largest uh, number of edges you can cut bigger or smaller than K. But this is a more natural version. Just you know, try to cut as many edges as you can. Uh, okay, another basic one is called max three lin. How this max prefix signifies that it's an optimization problem. So here you're given a bunch of equations a very special form, they all look like xi plus xj plus xk equals either 0 or 1 mod 2. So it's a system of equations modulo 2, each one having only three variables. Then you want to find an assignment or a solution satisfying as many as possible. Two more examples. Oh yeah, I can't do that here. Yes? Yeah, generally you want to, I mean, generally you would want to actually find the cut, not just sort of find the value of the best cut. Um, yeah. Do this a little. Okay. Uh, another familiar one is maximum independent set. Here you're given a graph again. And you want to find a subset of vertices which is independent and as large as possible. Okay, and the set is independent if it has uh, no edges inside it. And the last one is, uh, well, maybe I'll put it on the next board here. Um, called max k cover. It's sort of a variant of the set cover problem, if you know that one. So here you're given as input some sets. Let's say their union is uh, some ground set omega. And you're also given a number k. And your task is to choose some k of them. Uh, 
so the union is as large as possible. Okay, any questions so far? These are all some natural algorithmic basic tasks. And um, I'm going to add a piece of notation here. Uh, I want to look at the value of all the solutions as being uh, normalized to be between 0 and 1. Okay, so what I mean by that, just uh, when I say in max cut, you want to maximize the number of cut edges. Let's just look at the maximizing the fraction of cut edges. Okay, or maximizing the fraction of equations that you satisfy. Uh, maximizing the, the, f the fraction of the vertices that are in the independent sets and maximizing the, the fraction of the size of the ground set omega that you cover. And just that everything's on the same uh, scale between zero and one. And one more piece of notation. Uh, so given an input i, which is uh, either a graph or a collection of sets or what have you, um, we'll write opt of i for the value of the best solution. Okay, so ideally your algorithm would find a solution achieving value opt, but it could be a difficult problem, so it may not. And um, we're also given an algorithm A, We'll write uh, this alg sub a of i for the value of the solution that a achieves on i. Okay, which will be certainly less than opt, and you're happier the closer it is to opt. Okay, so finally I'll give you one more uh, definition, which is a key definition for us. grand to have it go all the way to the top. Well, okay. Uh, so here's the key definition. It quantifies how good an algorithm A is at uh, solving one of these problems. Is it possible to see that up there? You can still see it. Maybe Claire has some difficulty to look like this, but yeah. Anyway, maybe you know it anyway. Uh, so say that an algorithm A um, C comma S approximates the definition a problem such as max cut or max three lin if uh, well two conditions could, should hold um, one is just that A should be an efficient algorithm This is not really the main part of the definition, but I'll put it in here uh, anyway, just to, to remind you that we only want to consider algorithms that run in, let's say, polynomial time. Uh, but we won't need to care too much about what efficient means. It should just be, you know, an efficient algorithm. Uh, but here's the main definition. Uh, it should have the following property. Um, for all inputs, if the optimum is bigger than C, then the algorithm gets at least S. Okay, so let me make a remark. A uh, given algorithm might C comma S approximate uh, a problem for many different pairs, C and S, but this is sort of one basic way to quantify how well it does. You can prove that your algorithm, given an input where the optimum is at least C, uh, it achieves at least S. So ideally, you sort of C comma C approximated the problem for every C, then that would mean you've sort of exactly solved the problem, but that's hard to do for some problems like this. Okay, any questions? Okay, so let me give you some examples uh, of what we know about applying this definition to these problems, and you, maybe that will help you get used to the notation. Um, so let's take them roughly in reverse order. 
So here it's, uh, well, it can be an exercise if you want, or a theorem. Uh, the greedy algorithm, it's uh, one, one minus one over E approximates max K cover. So just to remind you of what this means, the greedy algorithm is the, maybe the first algorithm you'd think of for the K-cover problem. Just choose the largest set, then choose the next set that covers as many uncovered things as possible, and then the next set up until you've chosen K sets, which you're allotted. And what this means is it has the following property. If the input has the property that there are K sets which cover the whole universe, then the greedy algorithm will at least cover a one minus one over E fraction of the universe. I don't know what that number is, 0.6 something maybe. And uh, actually, it's not too hard to show that, indeed, it's a C comma C times one minus one over E approximation uh, for max K cover. Okay, so you might say that you just run the greedy algorithm, whatever the optimum is, it will achieve at least a one minus one over E fraction of the optimum. And um, this algorithm is uh, the best known algorithm for max K cover from the point of view of uh, approximation. Okay, so it's a simple algorithm that it does fairly well. Yeah, so if you want to make it uh, exactly precise, you would say that it's in uh, polynomial time. So the class P, actually we don't mind if it's a randomized algorithm, so if you uh, want to let it be in BPP, that's fine as well. Okay. Um, Right, so let's move on to, uh, let's talk about three lin for a second. Well, here's a, a fact. Actually, an even simpler algorithm does something for three lin. So it's the algorithm that outputs either the solution where everything is zero or the solution where everything is one. Uh, it's C comma one half approximates max three lin. Okay, so what we're saying here is it doesn't matter what the, the, the quality of the best solution is, if you do this simple algorithm, you'll at least satisfy half of the equations because the right-hand side will be either zero or one at least half of the time. Okay, so this is a very trivial algorithm. Uh, it's not the best algorithm you could uh, run in all cases. For example, we all well know that if you have a system of equations and it's satisfiable, I mean the equations are consistent, then you can find a consistent solution using, let's say, Gaussian elimination. Um, so what that means is this one, one approximates. Uh, now I'm stuck. Uh, approximates max three lin. Okay. So certainly if you're an algorithm, you can let's say try both of these things. Since you don't actually know what the optimum is, you can try both and see which one gives the best. Um, What's funny here is uh, these facts are also the best known algorithms for the max three lin problem, which looks a bit um, disappointing really. I mean, if there's this perfect solution, then okay, you can find it with Gaussian elimination. If uh, the optimum is a bit less than one though, maybe there's an assignment that satisfies 99% of the equations. Still, the best algorithm we know is this extremely trivial one that's only guaranteed to satisfy half of the equations. Um, yeah, so that's the state of affairs for algorithms for three lin. Um, okay, now we'll move on to the other two problems where the algorithms are a bit more sophisticated than these ones. Um, so here's a theorem. This is basically due to Alone and Kahan, uh, Kahane in 94. There's an algorithm based on um, a technique called semi-definite programming. Um, actually, in this case, 
I'm talking about the, the independent set problem here. Um, in this case, it's actually basically studying the low loss theta function, if you have heard of that. Um, well, it has a variety of properties, but in particular, uh, um, it, uh, let's say, 0.33334, and then um, 1 over n to the 1 quarter approximates max independent sets. Okay, this is just any number that's bigger than one third. So this actually is sort of, this is the best algorithm essentially that's known too for this problem. And it's sort of particularly disappointing. So what this is saying is this algorithm, if there's an independent set in the graph that's quite huge, it has almost a, a little bit more than one third of the vertices, um, then this algorithm manages to find an independent set that consists of maybe n to the three quarters of the vertices, which is far, far fewer. Here n is the number of vertices. Okay, and actually there's even some polylog factors here. But this is also the, essentially the best known algorithm for this problem. Okay, so sometimes these problems, I guess, are really hard. It looks kind of surprising even. And I'll give one more example about the max cut problem. This is to Gomans and Williamson in 94. It's also an SDP algorithm. So it's uh, somewhat sophisticated. And it has the following property. It, um, it's C comma um, arc cos one minus two C over pi uh, approximates max cut. Actually, for all C greater than some point eight four five. Okay, so it's a, uh, maybe you can tell by this arc cosine here, it's some kind of geometric algorithm, really. It has this property for every C. Um, this is actually the solution of tan theta over two equals theta or some such thing. Um, well, it's pretty good. I mean, if this is 0.9, then this is maybe 0.8. If this is like one minus epsilon, this is about one minus root epsilon. So it's a, a nice algorithm, and it's also the best known such algorithm. Okay, any questions? All right, so uh, this is the state of affairs basically for these four problems. And uh, we're not actually gonna be talking about uh, these algorithms really in the class, the course. We're not gonna be talking about how to prove algorithms. We're gonna instead be talking about how to prove hardness results, which is to say, uh, trying to prove that these results are best possible. You know, that you can't improve on any of these S numbers. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me tell you about the, the other side of the, the, the coin, which is inapproximability. Pardon me? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, for smaller c, it achieves some linear amount, basically 0.878 times c. And there are various um, subsequent papers that achieve better things for larger c. Um, the best is a paper of mine with Wu, where we achieve some explicit, arguably explicit function of c, which is not too pleasant to write down, but goes to one half as s goes to one half. Um, okay, so what about the other side of the coin? Um, so first we'll have a theorem of Feige from uh, 96. Okay. Uh, in fact, in all the theorems I'm gonna write, they should all begin as follows, for all delta greater than zero. Uh, Max K cover is uh, one, one minus one over E plus delta inapproximable. Assuming P does not equal NP. Okay, 
so what does this mean? I don't want to get too bogged down in technical definitions, but it, what it's saying is, um, well, it's the opposite of that. It's approximable in that there is no efficient algorithm that has this guarantee that if the optimum is one, it achieves you know, a number that's strictly bigger than one minus one over E. Okay. Well, actually, we don't really know how to prove any theorem to the form. There is no efficient algorithm that does X, essentially. But uh, we prove them all assuming this you know, standard assumption, P does not equal NP. Um, so that's uh, great in the sense that it sort of tells us this GREE algorithm is sort of uh, the best efficient algorithm there is, assuming P does not equal NP from the point of view of approximation. Um, okay. We have a result of Hostad, who will be speaking later. This is a 98. It's about max 3 lin. And he shows that this is 1 minus delta half plus delta, you know, proximable. Assuming P is not equal to NP. This is a pretty remarkable result, too, because, I mean, it equally shows that these two algorithms are sort of optimal. If, even if there's a solution that satisfies 99% of the equations, it's, it's, it's hard for efficient algorithms to satisfy even 51% of the equations. Right, so it's good if you're guaranteed that the input um, has optimum value one, i.e. there's an assignment satisfying all of the equations. Then in that case, yes, Gaussian elimination will find uh, a perfect solution. But this is saying if you merely know that the optimum is at least 99% uh, of the equations, then you know, if you do Gaussian elimination but like a few of the right-hand sides are wrong, then sort of the errors will creep up and combine and your final solution well, we'll satisfy at most 51% of the equation. Any other questions? Okay, so let me give you one more result along these lines. We'll move to independent set. It's a theorem of um, Denur and Safra. Denur will be speaking later today. This is from O2. The result I like very much. It's that um, maximum independent set is uh, one third comma one, I guess there's some deltas, minus delta one ninth plus delta in approximable, assuming P does not equal NP. Okay, so whereas these two examples, these two theorems uh, showed that the algorithms were sort of best possible, this is quite far, extremely far really from the best algorithm that we know. Basically, if there's an independent set that consists of one third of the vertices in a graph, they show that it's NP hard to find one that consists of one ninth of the vertices in the graph. Actually, this can be like P and P squared for any P less than uh, one third, let's say. Um, so that's a big uh, gap in our knowledge. And actually, this is, uh, to me, this is a very intriguing thing because, you know, if you ask, uh, let's say, can you get uh, one tenth of the, uh, an independent set of size one tenth, that's a problem that we don't know how to do efficiently, and we also don't know that it's NP-hard. So it's a problem of sort of intermediate status, like factoring. I mean, we just don't know if it can be done in polynomial time. Um, however, uh, if you're willing to make a stronger assumption, then we can get a stronger result. This is the theorem of uh, Code and Regev from O3, which says that max independent set is half minus delta, delta in approximable. Ah, this one does not go up. I'll continue it over here. Assuming, well, not P does not equal NP, but something else called the uh, unique games conjecture. abbreviated UGC. So this is a conjecture about um, the computational complexity. It's, it's definitely stronger than P does not equal NP. It has a funny status. I mean, you know, 99% of people believe that this uh, thing is true. By now, maybe even like 50% of people believe that unique games conjecture is true, and maybe 50% of the people believe that it's false. Um, 
But if you believe it, and there'll be a discussion of this like in later uh, lectures, I think, then you can get such strong inapproximability results as this one. This one is quite strong. It says even if there's an independent set that consists of almost half of the vertices, it's hard for you to even find an independent set consisting of 1% of the vertices. But quite, uh, it still doesn't quite complement the algorithm, which even has like a sub-constant function in the, the approximability guarantee, but it's a start. Okay, and just uh, to continue, the theorem of uh, Coat, Kindler, Mossel, and myself, 04, and also Mossel, myself, and Oleskovich from 05. Uh, when you put them together, you get something about max cut. Namely, that this algorithm is best possible. But also assuming this unique games conjecture. I'll define the unique games conjecture uh, later. Um, okay. So if you believe it, then this is uh, great in the sense that it sort of exactly, well, at least for C bigger than this 0.845, delineates how well we can approximate uh, maximum cuts. Let me add one more great theorem from recently. Uh, this is a theorem due to Raghavendra. In 09. And uh, it sort of gives like uh, these two complementary algorithms and hardness results together for most problems assuming the UGC. So uh, let me say roughly speaking, um, let's max law be any constraint satisfaction problem. That's a particular class of optimization problems that includes um, includes max cut and max three lin. Doesn't quite include independent set and K cover, but they're of the same flavor. Um, he shows there is an SDP based algorithm which, uh, let's see, and then some function s based on the nature of the problem of c approximates the problem. So he sort of says there exists this function s of c such that this algorithm c comma this much approximates it. And he gives a matching hardness. Uh, so it's uh, C minus, let me get this right, C minus delta S blah of C plus delta plus delta inapproximable if the unique games conjecture is true. It's like this. What did you suggest? Yeah, it's an increasing function. So the guarantee of an approximately gets worse as this number gets smaller and this number gets bigger. I think this is right. Um, so it says for a lot of these problems, actually, you know, generalizes this essentially. You have sort of a matching algorithm and hardness result, but only subject to this conjecture. And these deltas do cause a bit of a problem sometimes. Um, I should also say this is sort of based on some ideas by Per Ostrin, who's somewhere in the audience as well. Okay. So this is a natural time to stop and take some more questions, if there are any. No? Okay, so there's a you know, huge field devoted to algorithms for optimization problems, and uh, we're not gonna look at it. We're gonna look at the other side. How do you prove these kinds of results, in approximability results? Um, okay, so. Not 
quite, no. So uh, sometimes <coughs> uh, it's common to look at No, so it is actually often, uh, people often look at a somewhat less refined notion of approximability. So instead of sort of saying that an algorithm is a C comma S approximation algorithm for various pairs, they just look at the ratio between C and S. So sometimes you'll just see that it's a, a statement like this algorithm achieves approximation ratio one minus one over E, let's say, which means that it achieves C and that ratio times C for all C. But to sort of phrase the guarantee in the sort of most accurate possible way, you need to look at this sort of C comma S version. Okay, so let's talk about how one can prove in approximability results. Well, I uh, covered up some of the ones that we had, but um, these are all statements of the form, you know, this problem is hard assuming P does not equal NP. Actually, at least the first few were. Um, so it'd be more accurate to just to say they're NP hardness results. And if you've seen a little bit of computational complexity, then you probably were introduced to, you know, NP hardness proofs in uh, the setting of decision problems, yes, no problems. And the method of proving those results is typically by reduction from a problem that's uh, NP hard, that's as hard as anything in NP. And actually, the way to prove these inner approximability results is the exact same way as sort of uh, NP hardness reductions. But let me remind you just of how you would prove um, a simple sort of NP hardness or NP completeness result. So it's a very simple theorem that you would get an exercise in a uh, complexity class that any of these problems like max cut, the decision version is NP hard. So for K cover, one can phrase this as max K cover um, is one comma one in approximable. assuming P is not equal NP. Okay, so remember, Feige actually proved a much stronger result that it's even one comma one minus one over E in approximable, but this is a simple result that says it's hard, assuming P is not equal NP, to find the optimal solution. Indeed, it's hard, even if there's a perfect solution, to find such a solution. Okay. So this would normally just be uh, phrased as, you know, the K cover problem. Given a bunch of sets and the number k, are there k sets which cover everything? Is NP hard? These are basically the same statement. Um, in other words, you would say, you know, if there was an efficient algorithm that solved the k cover problem, that one comma one approximated the k cover problem, then there would be an efficient algorithm for solving all problems in NP or for solving any NP hard problem. And the way you prove such a result is by a polynomial time reduction from your favorite NP complete problem like uh, satisfiability or three colorability or what have you. So for the purposes of this talk, my uh, favorite uh, NP complete problem is three colorability. So to prove this, we would prove that three colorability uh, reduces in polynomial time to let's say one comma one approximating K cover, sorry, max K cover. In other words, there's a polynomial time reduction which maps uh, instances of this problem to instances of this problem and preserves the, the solution value so that if you could solve this problem efficiently, then you could solve free colorability or satisfiability or any NP complete problem efficiently. Okay, any questions about this? So just to say what I uh, said again, um, this theorem is equivalent to this, is stating that there exists some polynomial time algorithm R, a reduction which runs in time 
Well, polynomial, so it takes uh, an instance of three colorability, which is a graph, G. Thomason decided G is three colorable. And uh, you run R on it, and it outputs not an answer, but it outputs an instance of max K cover. Okay, so it outputs some sets, as well as the number K. This is an in input to max K cover. And R is efficient, it runs in time uh, the size of G to some constant. And it should have two properties. The theorem says that it has two properties. Okay, and the first one is called completeness. Basically it says if the input is a yes instance here, then it's a yes instance here. So you show that if G is three colorable, then uh, the optimum of this instance is one. So there exists K sets covering, let's say, a one fraction of the universe. Just uh, everything, where omega is the union of the S's. And soundness says that if G is not three colorable, then the optimum is strictly less than one. So for all K sets, they cover strictly less than a one fraction of the universe. Okay, so I said it in a bit of a complicated way, but this basically just says that the sort of the answer to G, whether or not it's three colorable, is the same as the answer to whether or not the optimum in this K cover instance is one. K is not really fixed. It's uh, output by this reduction, and it's probably going to be, let's say, linearly related to the cardinality of the universe. So you should think of it as pretty large, probably. Okay. So in other words, if we prove this theorem, then it says, you know, this problem is at least as hard as three colorability, and so it's, you know, NP hard. And again, uh, if you've taken a complexity class or you've seen a little bit of you know, theory of NP-completeness, then the proof of such a thing is some kind of relatively straightforward exercise. And it's usually done by um, some kind of introducing some kind of gadget. Okay, so uh, maybe for each vertex and edge pair. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, you, you're trying to design R. You look at G, it's got some, you know, maybe here's G, it's got some vertices and some edges. A, and you're trying to build an instance of K cover. So you need to introduce like some ground elements that are going to be omega, and you need to introduce some sets, and you also have to name this number K. And you do it by sort of putting like one sort of instance of the problem sort of attached to each edge. You know, it's like a gadget. You kind of put like, you put like, I think 64 ground elements for each edge, which I've drawn by dots here. And you'll put, you'll sort of introduce three sets for each vertex. and. Um, They'll be associated with the three colors somehow. So you'll call them like S sub red, S sub green, and S sub blue. So you'll have three times the number of vertices sets in your output, and you'll have like 64 times the number of edges in your ground set. And each set here will cover some of the vertices, there's some of the ground set here and here, and according to which edges it touches. It'll be some like simple kind of elementary construction. And then you'll show it has these two properties. Um, so in particular, the first property, whole completeness, will sort of hold by design. If I had a little bit more time, I mean, I'd just show you the, the proof. I mean, it's a pretty easy exercise, but in the interest of time, we'll keep going. Um, just what I mean by that is you'll sort of design the, the K cover instance or the gadget such that if you have a good three coloring, 
you know, that assigns red, green, or blue to each of the vertices, then, sorry, I should also say that in the reduction you take k to be the number of vertices. Then you sort of choose the obvious k sets and you sort of set it up so that it'll cover 100% of the ground elements. The soundness, this is the, sort of the harder part of the proof, is done in contrapositive. This is always going to be the case. So what does it mean to prove the soundness by contrapositive? You need to show that if there were, uh, if there were k sets covering, you know, uh, one fraction of the of the output, R of G, then you could somehow translate it into a three coloring of G. And that's the contrapositive. If the optimum is in fact one, then G is three colorable. Okay? And in the, the parlance that we're going to end up using, you want to say that if there exists this uh, good solution covering all of the set cover instance, or the K cover instance, then you can uh, sort of decode it into uh, three coloring of G. So I've just sort of sketched a standard sort of textbook uh, NP hardness result. Any questions? I know it's a bit, uh, it's a little bit unclear because I just sketched it, but this is how the, the framework goes. Yeah, so if, if uh, the solution, this K solution had one set per vertex, then it would be very natural to decode it into a three coloring just based on the name, and you would indeed show that it would give a three coloring. So the rest of the work is to show that a solution that you know, fails to choose one set per vertex will actually fail to cover all the ground set. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, <clears throat> That's how you prove sort of the, the, the simplest hardness result from max k cover to say that if the optimum value is one, there's a perfect solution, it's hard to find a perfect solution. But this is the sort of thing we're actually shooting for. This much stronger result of a fire that said it's actually hard, np hard, if there's a perfect solution, to find a solution covering a one uh, minus one over e fraction of the, the ground elements. So how would we prove that? Well, it's the exact same model. I mean, I'll just, uh, sorry Pierre if you're scribing, but I'll just adjust what's written here. Let's see if I can do it. Uh, so the theorem is that we want to prove this, so one minus one over E, actually plus delta for all delta. Um, so again, we reduce uh, our favorite NP complete problem, like three colorability to the problem of interest, one minus one over E plus delta approximating max K cover. So we need to similarly make a reduction. It'll be parameterized by delta. So uh, this will maybe be a constant depending on delta. Um, and again, we need to prove the completeness and the soundness uh, in the same way. So if the G is three colorable, we'll show that the optimum value of the reduced instance is one. And for the soundness, we'll have to show this. For all k sets, they cover at most a one minus one over e plus delta fraction of omega. Okay, and that shows that sort of if there's an algorithm that could tell the difference between these two cases, then that same algorithm when composed with R would be able to decide three colorability and therefore such an approximation algorithm is NP hard. So it's the same task as the NP hardness textbook uh, kind of exercise reductions, uh, except it has a much stronger property. So whereas, uh, okay, let me start a new board here. Stop. Okay, so here's the theorem. And now we kind of know how we need to prove it. We 
need to build this reduction from our favorite NP complete problem to one comma one minus one over E approximating K cover. Um, so we start with G, we have this reduction. Now as before, you know, it's kind of straightforward. I could write it down on one board. Here, the reduction that Fiverr uses is really long. I mean, it's, it's really, really long. I mean, to state it would take a really long time. Um, the gist of how it works is uh, the first part, he reduces, let's say, uh, well, uh, NP complete problem like three color, well, colorability is reduced, you know, to here, to some problem called uh, label cover. And this is sort of one standard part that goes into a lot of NP hardness approximation results. And this last part from label cover to max K cover, sort of the main part of what FIGA does. Okay. Actually, in this course, I'm not going to call it label cover because it's a weird name. Uh, I'm going to call it max projection. But I want to say this because that's what people normally call it. This is also a, a sort of an optimization problem and it's actually one comma delta approximating max projection. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll try to explain a bit more, but go ahead. Right, exactly. That's exactly uh, what uh, is done. Um, but I wanted to just give you the, the sense of the whole picture. But as you say, um, the way that essentially all of these hardness approximation algorithms, or hardness approximation results work is that they start from this max projection problem. Okay. So, um, you know, in the same way that if you want to prove like NP completeness results, there's like thousands and thousands of problems known to be NP complete and you fix, fix your favorite one like SAT or maybe three colorability and then you make thousands and thousands of reductions to your favorite problem. In the context of hardness approximation, it's very similar except with this max projection thing. So once we sort of know that this problem is hard, sort of all the reductions, including uh, this one of FIGA that I'll talk about, uh, begin from it. Um, so, uh, the theorem that this is actually hard, and I'll state it more uh, properly shortly, is due to, uh, well, it's a combination of things. It's the PCP theorem due to Aurora, Safra, and Aurora, Loon, Latwani, Suda, and Segedi, and plus the parallel repetition idea, which may be due to Feige and Killian, and also Raz. Okay, so these are a couple of difficult theorems. Irit Zuma will talk about the PCP theorem and maybe also, well, she'll talk about this whole uh, area in her course. But for the purpose of our course, we're gonna assume that this, this problem, which I'll define shortly, is hard. Okay, so the whole rest of the course, so the whole story about how proving inner proximity results will start sort of from this problem and it'll be about all the reductions, well, these reductions to various other problems. Does that make sense? Um, good. Um, okay. So let me basically end by stating what this, this you know, mother of all hardness approximation results uh, problem is, max projection, and just what the theorem about its hardness is. So unfortunately, it's a bit of a complicated problem, really. But it's important to know it. So it says, for all integers L and R, where L is bigger than R, um, I'm defining the problem here. So I'm defining an algorithm's problem, like max cut or max three lin. Okay, so it's parameterized by two numbers, L and R. So the max 
projection, sort of L comma R problem, is, well, has an input and an output. Uh, the input is a bipartite graph. So let's say the bipartition is U and V, and the edge set is E. And further, the bipartite graph has some basic properties. We'll assume that uh, both sides have the same number of vertices and that both uh, sides are regular. It's a bipartite graph, same number of vertices on each side, it's regular. That's the input. Well, there's an additional part to the input. These are the projections. Um, so in addition to the, the graph, we have uh, for each edge, The input includes a projection constraint, it's called. Hmm, I just realized I've gone into a horrible trap because I need a bit more board space, but this board won't move. I guess I'll write over here, sadly. Um, And this is just a map, pi uv from L to R. Continue backwards. I'll draw a picture as well. Ah, sorry, that's some notation that I should introduce. Uh, a number k in brackets is the set of numbers one, two, three, up to k. Thanks. Okay, so the picture is that you have an input, which is this bipartite graph. This is u, this is v, there's a bunch of edges. And attached to each edge is a map, pi sub uv a different one potentially from each, uh, for each edge. It maps the integers from one to L into the integers from one to R. And basically the idea is you're supposed to label each vertex. You're supposed to label all the vertices in U by a number between one and L. You're supposed to label the vertices in V by a number between one and R. And you want to respect as many of the projections as possible. Let me say that more carefully. The output, what the algorithm needs to output is an assignment. There's a map alpha, which takes everything in U to a number between one and L, and everything in V to a number between one and R. And the goal is to maximize the fraction of what I'll call consistent edges or uh, constraints. And what this means is simply that if you look at the label that you assign to a vertex U, then its image under pi UV should equal the label you assign to V. So some kind of strange generalization of like a graph coloring problem where you have sort of a different kind of constraint for each edge. Um, good. So uh, this is an algorithms problem and it's quite a hard one. Um, the theorem, but sort of the key theorem as I said that all the hardness of approximation results for max uh, three lin and max k cover, et cetera, are derived from is about the hardness of this one particular problem. So it's that uh, for all delta, there exists some L numbers L and R, which are um, of size one over delta to some constant, such that this problem is inapproximable. 
It's one comma delta, uh, sorry, max projection problem with L and R is one comma delta in approximable, assuming P does not equal NP. Okay, so that's, you know, this two-thirds of the FIGA proof, this reduction from, say, three colorability, a basic NP hard problem, to the sort of extreme hardness of this max projection problem. Any questions? Sorry. These, uh, there exists integers L and R, which are not too big compared to delta. They're at most one over delta to some universal constant. So in other words, this problem becomes sort of harder and harder as L and R get larger because somehow there's more choices for the algorithm. It has to decide how to label each of these, these vertices. So as L and R become harder, larger and larger, the, the algorithmic task becomes harder and harder. And what this is saying is that you can sort of make it arbitrarily hard just by making L and R sort of uh, sufficiently large. You know, maybe one over delta to the 10 large. Uh, and just to remind you what this says, I mean, it says that this algorithmic task, given this somewhat complicated looking input, um, even if there is an assignment that satisfies all of the projections, all of the constraints, there's no efficient algorithm that can even satisfy a delta fraction of the constraints. So it's sort of really hard to satisfy these instances at all. And that's, that's known to be true, assuming P does not equal NP. Any more questions? Okay, so that's why there's a lot of, I mean, this, this whole uh, course is just, uh, the first lecture was about definitions almost. Um, but next time we'll see how we can take this theorem as a black box and then start to prove some of these hardness of approximation results I stated earlier. So we'll focus on the K cover problem and this FIGA result in the next lecture. Okay, so I guess it's lunchtime now, right? And then we reconvene at 1.30? Okay, any, any additional questions since we have a few more minutes? Yeah. Uh, it is, yes, although I think that follows sort of uh, directly from this fact. This is sort of, this can only be made, let's say it can only be made an arbitrarily small constant. And so it's, it's even stronger, this is a stronger statement than a statement like C comma delta uh, for any C less than one. This sort of statement would say that even if it's, let's say, 90% satisfiable, it's hard to find a solution satisfying a delta fraction. This is a stronger statement. And because it holds for all delta, it doesn't really matter if you write like C delta here because you can make delta smaller again. Yeah, it is hard to, when you see it the first time, sort of parse the meaning of these statements and which is stronger than which. Is it better if this number is smaller or bigger? Um, more questions? Okay, see you after lunch.